We'll begin section 1.5 talking about infinite limits and their properties. We're going to look at a graph of the function of f of x is equal to 1 divided by x. Now, what's important to understand is that though we're going to be writing things like infinity or negative infinity, the actuality is that the limit is not going to exist. So, for instance, if I look at the limit as x approaches 0 from the left, that's talking about this portion of our graph. And we can see that this portion of our graph is going to continue as we get closer to 0, the value of the function gets lower and lower and lower. So I'm going to write negative infinity because it's going to continue downward forever. But it's important again to remember that if I were asked if the limit exists, the limit would not exist. So even though I'm going to write negative infinity, that's really a way for us to know what exactly is ha happening to the function at that point. If I'm looking from the right hand side, so from the right hand side is this portion of the graph. Now as I approach zero, it's getting greater and greater and greater. So this limit would be infinity, but again, in actuality, it doesn't exist. And we already know that the limit as x approaches zero does not exist. And it does not exist because the limit approaches different values um, from each side of the value of x equals zero. Just as we did before, it's important that we understand how to reason through this analytically. So I don't want to make a table because it's time consuming and I don't want to just rely on a graph. I want to be able to use my brain as well. So here it says determine the number C for each function uh, not in the domain. So let's focus on F of X first. So for F of X, we're saying the limit, we're going to find the limit as X approaches some C value that's not in the domain. Now here, because it's a rational function, we're worried about when does that denominator um, equal zero. So we need x minus four to not equal zero. So x can't be positive four. So that's the value that we're going to be concerned about. So we're going to find the limit as x approaches four from the left, and then we're going to find the limit as x approaches 4 from the right and see what happens. Again, in this case, we're looking at values approaching 4 from the left. So again, if you think about a number line, to the left of 4 is 3 or 3.5 or 3.9 and so forth. So we're looking at values that are less than 4. If I put a number that's less than 4 into this function, I'm going to get a negative denominator. I'm going to have three in the numerator and the denominator is going to be some increasingly small negative value. So just as a quick reminder, if you have a denominator that is continually going up, that limit is going to approach zero because you're dividing by a much, much larger number. Every time you divide by a larger number, the value gets smaller. But if you have a denominator that's decreasing, that limit is going to go to infinity or negative infinity, depending on this sign. So in this case, I've got three divided by an increasingly small number, which means my um, quotient will increase. So in this case, this is going to increase onto infinity, but because of the negative value, my answer is negative infinity. Now let's continue. We have limit as x approaches 4 from the right. And as x approaches 4 from the right, we're looking at values that are to the right of 4 on the number line. So 4.1, 4.2, etc., up to 5. So values that are greater than 4. If they're greater than 4, I'm going to have, say, 5 minus 4, which is 1, or 4.1 minus 4, which is 0.1. And again, these values will continue to decrease, but they will be positive values, which means here we're looking at a positive result. 
Now let's do the same thing for the second example. For the second example, we're saying where is the denominator going to equal zero? So we need x plus two to not equal zero, which means x cannot be negative two. So let's look at the limit as x approaches to neg no, positive, negative two, so, whew, sorry, negative two from the left. And then we'll look at the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the right. So again, looking at our number line, negative 2 from the left would be values to the left of negative 2, which is negative 3 or negative 2.5 or negative 2.1 and so forth. So that's going to give me, say, if this was negative 2.1 plus 2, that gives me a negative 0.1, but it's squared. So it's always going to be positive. But as I get closer to 2, say 2.0, uh, well now it's 0 0.01 squared. So this number is, this is negative 3 in the numerator, but the denominator is again decreasing, but because we're squaring it, it's positive, which means negative 3 divided by an increasingly small number is going to take me to negative infinity. And then to the right of two, negative two, would be a value like negative one or negative 1.5 or negative 1.9 and so forth. So again, we're going to end up with the same situation. So even though these values are going to be positive now, we are going to still square that. And so it's still going to be a negative three over a increasingly large, uh, increasingly small number which gives me, again, negative infinity. Now let's take a look at those graphs to see if they agree. Looking at those same two functions now graphically, we can see that analytically we were correct. The first function we knew at x equals four, that was going to be a problem. But from the left, we were approaching negative infinity and from the right, positive infinity. And for our other function, we determined that the value was at negative two but that both sides would approach negative infinity. So we were correct in both of our um, assumptions. Now let's take a look at the properties of infinite limits. These properties should look familiar to you. We talked about these properties of just regular limits. They're just made a touch more complicated from the fact that we have infinity involved. So for each of these properties in this column, we're assuming that the limit as x approaches c of f of x is infinity, and the same for g of x is some limit l. So we're thinking about some positive or negative value. So if I have the limit of f of x is infinity and the limit of g of x is some constant like one or negative 17, it really doesn't matter what I add or subtract to infinity. It makes sense that that result would be infinity because I'm adding or subtracting very small numbers as compared to the number infinity or the idea of infinity. So for instance, the limit as x approaches zero from the left of one plus one over x squared, we know this limit would be one because it's one, but the limit of one over x squared from the left is infinity. So I'm taking one plus infinity which means my result is infinity. For product, the result all depends on the sign of L. So again, if we're thinking about f of x having a limit of infinity and g of x, if g of x has a limit where L is greater than zero, then it's basically infinity times some positive value giving me a positive infinity. Or if L is less than zero, then it's infinity times some negative value resulting in negative infinity. So again, if we're looking at the function of three times the cotangent of x, if I look at three times the cotangent of x, the limit as x approaches zero from the right of three is three. And the limit of cotangent of x zero from the right is positive infinity. So it's basically three times infinity, which is still infinity. And for the last one, for quotient, again, if you think about the work that we've done with the analytical uh, limit finding, 
we know that if we're dividing some value by a very, very small number, that result is infinity. But if we, res if we divide by a very, very large number, that result is going to get closer and closer to zero. So that's what we have here, is we have g of x, again, is some limit, and f of x is infinity. So I've got some value being divided by a very, very large number, and the result is zero. So if I look at the limit as x approaches one from the left of x squared plus one, so that would be one plus one or two, and then the cotangent of pi over x, Again, if I'm looking at one, basically one pi from the left-hand side would be negative infinity. So I've got two divided by a very, very, very small, I'm sorry, a very, very large number resulting in a very small number, or in this case, zero. Up next, we're going to take a look at vertical asymptotes.